I'm Dr. Michael DeTola. And I'm Megan Strong. In our case of the week, the golden rule is observed, but the rule of 27 gets worked over like a heavy bag at Gold's Gym. <laughs> and phone scammers in Florida threaten to ruin one dentist's reputation. And I can barely get my hygienist to give an injection for me. See what a hygienist in South Carolina does for one of her patients. That and more on today's Chairside Live. Hello and welcome to episode 92 of Whoa. Chairside Live. 92, 1992. Yep. You know what I remember about that more than anything else? What? Um, in February of that year, uh -huh. Wright said friend song, I'm Too Sexy, was number one in this country. That was the beginning of this long <laughs> downward slide that we've been on ever since. Right. Can you sing us a little bit of it? or I cannot. Okay. Uh, I don't even think we can get the rights to put part of that video in here. but Unfortunately. But you'd but like to think that if that song came out today, I'm Too Sexy for my shirt, I'm Too Sexy. You'd like to think people would say, what is this? Yes, right. Enough of yeah. that. But they no, wouldn't. Today no, they he'd wouldn't. run for president and possibly yep. win. Well, we've got an interesting case of the week for you today. It's a Bruxer Bridge, or at least it was supposed to be a Bruxer Bridge. It was a case where a PFM bridge had fractured. The dentist removed the bridge and sent it in because he told the patient that they would be able to do an all ceramic bridge, hopefully. And uh, we'll take a look and see what ended up being done by the technician and why. In fact, let's go ahead and take a look at that now. Well, there it is, the broken PFM bridge, and uh, that's been cut off and sent in by the, the dentist. That's going to be replaced. And one thing, just briefly, look at the connector size between the ponic and the abutment there. That's going to come into play, but that didn't, did not break. Uh, the dentist cut through uh, the connection between the ponic and the mesial abutment. But you look at that, and that's, that's pretty tiny what you see going on there, and that's definitely one of the benefits of metal. As you probably heard me say, I haven't done a single unit PFM. Uh, since 2009, since we've had uh, Bruxer, but PFM bridges, uh, I still have a use for because of the fact uh, that you can make these connectors as small as you can because of the strength of metal. So even though we can take a single unit of Bruxer and hammer it into a piece of wood, when it comes to a bridge and a connector, that's a different story. So I don't do single unit PFMs anymore, but uh, metal bridges still do it. So let's take a look at what we got sent from the dentist, a nice, conscientious, wonderful dentist who sent us a full arch lower impression for this three unit bridge. One of the contraindications of a double arch tray is in fact a three unit bridge. So um, sending in a, a full arch impression like that's fantastic and a full arch upper to go with it with a separate bite registration. That's absolutely wonderful. And when we pour up this case and take a look at it, Things look pretty good. We've got some really nice preps there when we look at those two teeth. Those are pretty, pretty close to ideal, just examining those two preparations. And of course, the question we always have as a laboratory is, what does our occlusal reduction look like? And so we'll take a look here. I'll lift the pin just to make sure that's not interfering at all. And see, here's the challenge. Well, let's pretend it's a real patient. We're kind of looking at it from this angle, probably pulling the cheek back and trying to get a look. That's kind of our best case look that we'd ever get. Maybe we get the patient to turn a little this way, um, but it, it's hard to do. And this is one of the reasons why I love a depth cut based preparation sequence, because you always know exactly where you are. So the dentist uh, finished these preparations and sent them into us. If we look at just the solid model for a second, We'll notice it's probably just a little easier to see here without the upper one, that when we look at it from the side, we've got a little bit, not really a, a huge bump of soft tissue here, but we can see that our mesial margin and our distal margin on the by are both below that. So any bridge is gonna, framework is gonna have to come up and over that tissue. There hasn't been any recontouring done here to that tissue. Again, wonderful impression, wonderful preparations. Uh, but any bridge work is going to have to come up and over this soft tissue here, which might get you thinking, hmm, I wonder if uh, zirconia is going to be able to handle that. Uh, I wonder if the dentist could have gone and removed some of that tissue. Probably could have. Uh, but let's take a look. You know, gone are the days of just having to try to visually assess what's going on and figure it out. This is one of the huge uh, benefits of CAD CAM. And so basically what happens is when you send in these two impressions to us. The upper and lower models uh, get poured and then they get scanned and then articulated with the bite. And so now all of a sudden we're able to bring it into the digital realm 
And this is where um, things really get interesting for us because it's no more uh, about guessing. You know, we can put, we can try in our virtual bridge and see what, uh, what it would look like, what the proper anatomy would be as we put it into place, the two abutments and the pontic, and say, okay, this is, these are designs from our library. You know, obviously, when I got into dentistry 26 years ago, you know, there wasn't a lot of times where you would have technicians necessarily carve you know, anatomy like this for you, uh, especially on abutment teeth. You'd have to give them enough room to be able to, uh, to do it, and uh, you'd probably have to pay a lot of money too. And you can see, you know, some of the less featured teeth. The resolution's a little lower over there, but you can see the designs that get pulled from the library now pretty much have ideal anatomy on them. And then we can see areas where we're going to have contact with the opposing teeth. And let's take a look now and see what we have in terms of vertical height. We mentioned the rule of 27 in the open, and if you'll recall what the rule of 27 is, that's the rule that says on a three-unit bridge that's going to be fabricated from zirconia that we need to have uh, 27 square millimeters as our connector between the pontic uh, and either of the abutments, and it's the height squared times the width. So essentially, we're looking at something that would be three millimeters high, which would be nine, three, three squared is nine, times three millimeters wide, across this way and that would be our 27 square millimeters and as long as we have 27 square millimeters three millimeters across and three vertically as well or you can fudge it a little bit if it's 2.6 millimeters vertically you can make it slightly wider uh, buccolingually and still have the appropriate strength you can't flatten it all the way you can't vertically have one millimeter and then have you know 27 millimeters wide that's not going to work um, but you can play around with it a little bit. And so as we look here, we're going to notice that between, this is from 19 to 21. Uh, so we're going to see here that, um, or actually I should say 18 to 20. It got, it got written up uh, incorrectly on the lap slip. But you can see that between the bicuspid and the first molar, the height is 1.65 millimeters. Now we'd like that to be 3 millimeters, but this takes into consideration the tissue that's there where we have to come up and over this tissue to get to this ponic. So 1.65 is pretty narrow vertically. That's not, uh, that, that's at the boundary of not being sufficient. We'll go back a tooth and between the ponic and the distal abutment, we have 1.63 millimeters. So that means that we're going to have to make it much wider than we ordinarily would if we had three millimeters here. And when we start to look at the width of this, we can see that we've got two millimeters. We're not even really getting to three millimeters uh, between the bicuspid and the pontic, and we're at 2.66 between the pontic and the molar here. And so to take this out to four millimeters where it would need to be to support that decrease in the vertical height of the connector, obviously it's just gonna be a block of teeth there and not very, uh, not hygienically acceptable, a bad periodontal situation, and bad aesthetically even though it's in the posterior. So. Uh, that's starting to look like we're definitely not going to be able to do uh, a, a Bruxer Bridge, full contour zirconia bridge there. Let's look at some reduction here. As we look right through the bicuspid area, you can see where this slice is taken. So the three-dimensional model has a 2D cross section. And you can see from the preparation out to the opposing tooth, we have 1.21 millimeters. That's plenty for Bruxer. Uh, we, we prefer one millimeter as the ideal thickness of Bruxer, but anything above that, like 1.2, is even better. If you've seen the hammer test where we hit that crown and it goes into the piece of wood, that's actually 1.5 millimeters if you want to try to achieve that strength. We often say the minimum thickness of Bruxer is 0 0.6 millimeters, and it is, but that's really not desirable. We always want to go more than that if we can, just because it allows you to make any adjustments that you need to make. In fact, while I'm talking about that, if you look at what this doctor has done in terms of margins, you'll see some nice chamfer margins on both of these preparations. We'll also often say that Bruxer can tolerate a feather edge margin much like cast gold, and that's true, but that doesn't mean it's preferred. It will handle it, but you're always going to be better off having something a little bit thicker like this because milling zirconia to a feather edge can get a little bit dicey and so there is a tendency to leave it a little bit thicker so it doesn't chip and break um, you know, at any point, either when they're finishing it after it's been sintered or when it's in the mouth. So even though it can handle a feather edge when necessary, a chamfer margin is preferable. Kind of like even though Bruxer can handle 0 0.6 millimeters, 1.0 uh, is more ideal and 1.2 is even better. And we can look on the molar as well 
And as we look at the molar, just mesial to the midpoint right along here, you can see we have 0.72 millimeters, 0.72 millimeters. So we're getting pretty close to that 0.6, to that minimum thickness. This will work, but there's going to need to be a note to the doctor letting him know that if anything needs to be adjusted, if the bite happens to be high here because of the temporary bridge or whatever, this opposing tooth is going to need to be adjusted and not um, whatever material is down here, if in fact it's going to be something along the lines of a zirconia material because Bruxer does not want to be less than six tenths of a millimeter. So that's just mesial to the midpoint of that tooth. And if we go just distal um, to that, we'll see that we have 0.95 millimeters. So there we're doing a little better. We're closer to, much closer to, in fact, almost right on that 1.0 millimeters. That's an ideal thickness for Bruxer. Of course, like I said, Bruxer likes it even uh, thicker than that. Uh, all the way to two millimeters, it just continues to gain strength. The strength for zirconia really drops off at around six tenths of a millimeter, which is why we consider that the minimal. So when you look at this, we've got 0.72 and we've got 0.95. Let's, let's glance again just at the models and see if we can see that. I don't know. Can you, I, it's difficult to tell. You know, oftentimes, you know, we can, we can cheat in the laboratory and look from the lingual side and go, oh yeah, that is a little close. And it's the lingual cusp of that upper tooth. It always is. You know, I always tell Dennis, it, what I do is I, if I'm just going to place a couple depth cuts, it's going to be in the central groove and on the two lingual cusp tips because those are always the one on these posterior teeth that cause the problem. So just to the mesial, that's where we have the 0.72 and just distal, that's where we have that 0.95 millimeters where we're going to be okay. So in terms of occlusal reduction, we actually have... Um, enough thickness on both of those teeth. There's our 1.2 millimeter on the bicuspid that we have, and that's going to be fine too. So in terms of occlusal reduction, we actually have enough room to do the Bruxer, but in terms of uh, having a bridge and the proper rule of 27, 27 square millimeter connector size between the abutments and the pontic, we do not have it. And so even though the occlusal clearance is there, um, for the Bruxer bridge because of the fact that the rule of 27 would be violated. We're not able to do that. And thus, we called the dentist and let him know that a PFM bridge is going to be the way to go here. Um, there's, there's not going to be a way to predictably have uh, a zirconia bridge here that will not fracture, and it will fracture at those kind of dimensions. It's simply not uh, going to be able to work. And so for this dentist and for this patient, a PFM bridge, is going to have to be um, redone. Not a bad looking PFM bridge. Does it look as good as Bruxer? Eh, maybe not, but as you can see, the doctor prepared enough for us uh, so that we don't really have any metal margin showing anywhere on the bridge. And so hopefully the patient will be uh, happy with the result, even though they weren't able to do the Bruxer. And when the bridge uh, goes into place, you can see now, in fact, we have room to come up and over that tissue. And of course, we have room on the occlusal as well. They didn't even have to do a, a metal occlusal there. And um, again, it brings me back to that, uh, that original bridge when we looked at that originally, and I just kind of mentioned that right off the bat. And that is, you can see how small that connector is from the occlusal to the gingival on that PFM bridge. So do not throw you know, PFMs away yet, certainly not for multiple unit restorations like this because it still plays a very valuable role. There, there's simply only two choices here. It's a PFM bridge, or a cast gold bridge. The only two materials that are strong enough, or any kind of cast metal, that are strong enough to have a small enough connector to get up and over that tissue and still be able to connect the ponic and abutment with enough strength not to break. I mean, I've only seen one metal framework I break, uh, break I think, in about 26 years of dentistry. If this were a Bruxer bridge, or I should say, if this were a Bruxer bridge, that's pretty much a guaranteed fracture. I don't know when, if it's two weeks, two months, two years. Uh, but it will break because before we were aware of that rule, we sent out a lot of bridges like this in zirconia and they did in fact break. And so if you get a call from us about that, you'll know why. Uh, we don't want it to break. The patient doesn't want it to break. And if it violates the rule of 27, it's simply not going to work as a solid zirconia bridge. Thank you for that, Dr. You're D. Welcome. Now let's go to a segment we call Viewer Mail. This week's viewer mail comes to us from the Garden State, New Jersey, from Dr. Greg Smith, and he writes, Hello, Dr. Detola. Maybe I'm overthinking things, but I have a patient with cracked tooth syndrome on a lower second molar and only a small existing restoration. I, I know I want to cover the occlusal surface, but don't want to do a traditional crown prep, and we are going to rule out cast metal. 
So my prep design is about 1.5 millimeter occlusal reduction with a chamfer, but way super gingival, trying to be minimally invasive. So more like an onlay. So now the hard part is material choice. Even though I use IvoClean in Z Prime Plus, I'm afraid of, it, of retention issues with such a short prep and lack of bonding ability, which leaves out zirconium. So now my choices are either Emacs or Composite. Composite is a, in, a, in a high wear area probably won't look very good in a short time. That leaves Emacs. Emacs worries me in such a high stress area. So which material would you choose? Well, um, Greg, I don't think you're overthinking that. I think you actually thought about that uh, fairly rationally, although I'm going to come to a slightly different conclusion that you did. And I'm also going to say that for most of the patients that uh, I have treated on those lower second molars, that 1.5 millimeters of occlusal reduction is probably on the optimistic side. It's difficult to do. A, a lot of those teeth just don't have that much clinical crown. And if, in fact, you were to prepare 1.5 millimeters of occlusal reduction in the central groove, a lot of time that central groove will end up being subgingival. And now all of a sudden we've got this preparation that's really deep but ends up being subgingival, and we lose a lot of retention there as well. So I, I like your idea of doing the onlay instead of the crown, if possible, since it is very conservative and the only thing we have is that crack tooth syndrome and not really any missing cusps. But I'm going to probably go the other way and say that just from what I've seen in my own dentistry and dentistry here at the laboratory, that that 1.5 is, is really elusive. And I bet when it's all said and done and you have a prep that's conservative, I know you want to be minimally invasive, as you mentioned, that it's going to end up, that zirconia is going to end up being our only choice. And so Bruxer will do very well uh, in a situation like that. I've never actually placed Emacs on a second molar. Uh, mainly because I am, like you, worried about how it's going to fare in an area where the bite forces are so strong. They don't get any stronger than on second molars. I mean, unless the patient has their third molars and they're in occlusion. But otherwise, that's as tough of a situation as it's going to get. And so while it is easier and more predictable to bond to lithium disilicate to Emacs than it is to the full contour zirconia, I'm still going to go with the zirconia just because it's three times as strong as the Emacs. Now, if you adhesively bond Emacs into place, it will effectively take about twice as much force to break it as if you conventionally cement it in place. But we're still talking with full contour zirconia based on the thickness three to maybe even four times more strength back in that area. So even with an onlay, I've done Bruxer onlays before on first and second molars and haven't had any of them uh, debond. If you, you, know, you can use the IvoClean, as you mentioned, or you can also sandblast it as well and use the Z Prime Plus and then use, I would use uh, a self-etching resin cement at that point. So either something like Panavia F 2.0 or Multi-Link Auto Mix. And I feel pretty good about using that kind of protocol and bonding that into place that it's not going to fall off. Certainly on an onlay like that, we're going to want to keep the axial walls as straight up and down as possible. In fact, almost intentionally try to undercut it while you're preparing that. Um, you discarded lab fabricated composites, and I totally agree. I don't think that's a good choice there. Not just because it wouldn't look good, I just don't think it'll last either. But I think with Emacs, even though it occupies this nice zone in terms of a combination of strength and aesthetics, I just don't feel like I need any aesthetics on a second molar. So I am definitely going with the zirconia. Even though we can't bond to it quite as well, my bigger concern in a case like this is just overall strength and having the patient chew on it. Uh, for five years and 10 years and uh, into the future, I'm just less worried about the zirconia than I would be about the Emacs. And you did say early on, we're going to rule out cast metal, which is unfortunate. Uh, but I have to rule that out all the time too. But that obviously, I think, is in fact um, the correct answer is that a cast gold crown would probably be the best thing. But um, in short of that, if we can't do cast gold, I'm going to go with full contour zirconia. I'm less worried about a possible debond than I am about possible breakage of a weaker material. So I choose zirconia. Let me know what you choose, and I'd be happy to hear how this turns out yes. a year from now and see if it's still in place and, uh, and how it's doing. And because of the fact that you thought you were maybe overthinking this, I would like to provide you with a great gift where you don't have to do any overthinking and that is the puzzle with only 30 pieces. Uh -huh. This is the one where uh, my cat accidentally like put the last two pieces in place. On. Just with her tail, just hitting pieces randomly over to the side. So no overthinking here. So when he's done mm -hmm. analyzing this tooth and overthinking and it's time to relax and get ready to go to bed, 
Nothing better than a little uh, chair side 30 piece puzzle right, on the end table. A little puzzle and some warm milk, and you'll be asleep. Exactly. And what would it be without a beautiful photograph? It'd from still Chair be a side puzzle. Live. But with the photograph, right, but now you, it's, it's got... It's like double time because the the photo, I'm sorry, the puzzle is actually a, a photo right. of you, right. the guy. And then now we've got this photo. Right. Double time. I've been taking just one piece out of each of these before we send it to the dentist just to drive me crazy. It yeah. actually wouldn't even surprise me. And, and I then wonder... I sell it to them on eBay. Gosh. That's how I'm going to retire. Okay, sounds like a plan. But um, in this picture, every episode we're trying to figure out what was going on in the picture. Mm -hmm. My hands are in the air, just, I'm not even sure. I went to Catholic school and I saw a lot of stained glass windows where people were doing that. So I feel like you're either about to do a miracle or you just did one or I just made a confession and you're absolving me. Right, that's not anywhere close to what Or that it was. could be a what the hell. That's you know, probably kind of, what that was. You think was. that's what that is? Either that or... Are, that's, that kind of looks like an are you kidding me? Could be. Yeah. Could be because your eyes are kind of big and you right. got that doe like look. The deer in the headlights kind of look of what, what's gonna, what ridiculous thing will come out right. of its mouth. Okay, next. anyways, let's stop the bleeding here. We're just going to send this off to you. Here we go. We will. And that's been popular. In fact, there have been dentists who've come up to the booth at shows and saying, I haven't written in, but please. Send me one. Yeah, please send me a picture. So, so um, I think people, I think dentists like the funny expressions and yeah. I think they like, yeah, the right-hand side of the picture more than they like the left-hand side. But uh, thank you, Greg. Appreciate the question. And might we have any news? We do. As a dental professional, you give a lot to your patients, time, energy, and care. But a hygienist in South Carolina is giving one patient much more than just a teeth cleaning. She is set to give him one of her kidneys. The patient was diagnosed with kidney failure, and unfortunately, no one seemed to be a match to donate. So the hygienist was tested, and she was found to be a match, and the surgery was scheduled. That's pretty amazing. That's one of right. the better. That's one of the better things. I, I've never given a body part, but I give a lot of money to okay. a hygienist, to my ex-wife. <laughs> but um, the, the, that is amazing that she would even go through and have the testing. I because, know. and didn't lie about it. And then go, oh yeah, no, I was tested. I'm not a match. Yeah, and yeah. you know what? I was trying to think. It didn't say, but I was wondering if there was more of a connection between them like maybe they've been friends for years or you know somehow related in some way you know what i mean otherwise it's like just some random patient you're like sure i'll give you my kidney well it's a um you know it's funny because being a high and i'm not a hygienist but hygiene is different than dentistry in the sense that uh it's you and the patient for close to an hour, sure. you know, together while you're in there and you're right. performing tasks that are, you know, kind of uh, nauseous, make some people nauseous right. going in there and cleaning something. So you're kind of really, you've got this relationship, you've got somebody's head kind of right here. I mean, it might mm -hmm. be more symbolic than anything else, but in dentistry, we don't talk as much to the patient as the hygienists do because right. they're not using hand pieces and filling their mouth with water constantly. So... I do think that hygienists tend to get close relationships um, with patients, and patients certainly have their favorite hygienists, but this is unbelievable. It yeah. got me thinking what I would donate to you if, if, if something like this happened. And, and? Um, well, so far, I'm, I'm up to a toe. Okay. Um, I feel like uh, if you lost one of yours or three of yours and, and one of mine, because it's probably bigger, uh -huh. would, would take the place of a couple Ooh, of yours. Gosh. Uh, I'm up to that. I haven't got to any of the major organs yet, like kidney or liver, but I, I continue think to think about people this. Don't, I don't think people donate toes. That's, um, not, that's not a thing. Uh, I I, did you see the movie The Big Lebowski? Nope. Yeah, there was a, there was a toe in question, oh. but uh, you never know. You, you'd be a little off balance if you lost a couple of them. So. Do you know what happens when they, sometimes when people don't have like, okay, so if they lose a toe, you need your toes to balance. Right. And so sometimes they'll actually take, they'll sacrifice their thumb right. and put it on their toe. You know what they call that? A tum. <laughs> no, I don't. Why don't you tell me? I think I just heard half of it. I just told you. A tum. Oh, a tum? Yeah. It's a toe thumb. A toe thumb, like a spork from Kentucky Fried Chicken. I didn't realize that's where you're going from. Yeah, oh, it's a real deal. I, didn't, I thought you said like the first half of it, not the rest of it. No, it's well, that's what I'm saying. You don't want to be without a thumb, right? No, but yeah, I know. Well, what? let me give you a toe. I, <laughs> I don't want a toe. I, you don't need a toe. I'm just saying, if you do need a toe, I'm there. I'm your guy. Okay. I'm your guy. Sounds good. Thank it's you just so much for your generosity. Little bigger, little hairier. Okay, that's, that's all. Disgusting. Don't wear open-toed <laughs> shoes. You're gonna want to stick to pumps and espadrilles. Anything else? Oh gosh, yes, please. 
A Florida dentist says scammers hijacked her office phone line. Thousands of people flooded her line with angry demands to stop calling them. At one point, the office was getting seven to eight calls per minute, interrupting the calls from regular patients. Apparently, the calls were part of a scam. The callers were promising people that the government would send them money if they provided their checking account number and other information. Unable to stop the phone calls coming in, the doctor contacted authorities to put a stop to it. Detectives are currently investigating the matter. I would give you an ear, too. Thank you. I'm up to ear. Appreciate it. And, and, and a tooth or two. Nice. If you, didn't, if you, you lost some and right. you know, couldn't have an implant for some reason. I was going to say, we work in a laboratory and we do implants so why? That's true. We, well, you never know. You I may appreciate not be a candidate. It, but this story is awful where it reminds me of, a, there's this group called the Touch Tone Terrorists. And they intercept um, incoming phone calls, and like on behalf of UPS or okay. FedEx, and people call asking about their package, and they just they're crank calls. So yeah. a real person calls in, they intercept it, and they just dismiss them out of hand. Oh, start gosh. saying it's your fault, you're an idiot, you know, and they and then they record it, and you hear yeah. these people get really angry, even though they think they're talking to somebody at FedEx, and they're really not. And that's what this reminded me of. Right. Somehow. They were making these scam calls trying to get people to give their social security number uh -huh. and, and, and bank account information. And they were coming from this dentist's office and then people were calling back angry. And so it wasn't so much they were missing their real patients' calls. It was just total public outrage that it appeared a dental office was right. doing this kind of scam. Totally. And the, but the patients, they were saying the patients couldn't get through because they were always on the line with the other, with the people complaining. And so the patients had to start emailing any requests or questions or whatever, which would be so annoying. Um, but whatever. But I, I just think it's so crazy to think that there's the technology that people can do that right. and um, what's even crazier though is that unfortunately there are people who fall victim to this and think it's a real thing and I guess some of the um, angry phone calls to the dentist's office were demanding that they get their money back right so they had had money taken from them and whatever and so I mean of course the moral of the story is that like be aware of what the warning signs are for a scam and don't give your information to anybody. Absolutely. I think these might be the same people who are, are making bad uh, tweets and, and posting and, and then sending uh, bad uh, texts after I've had a couple glass of wine. I think it might be the same group that's doing that, that's breaking into my phone. You know... Thankfully, that's not happening. Thankfully, because I don't think that that's even... It's not happening. No. Nope. But now we have somebody to blame if we ever send Perfect. out something that we don't like. We've been hijacked by the, the Florida dental people. See? All right. Cool. Kind of scary, but uh, hopefully best of luck to that dentist that they get that all straightened out and the patients and everybody else realize that it had nothing to do with the dental office. Well, that about wraps it up for this week's edition of Chairside Live. On behalf of myself, Megan, the CSL crew, and everybody here at the lab, I want to thank you for your time and your continued commitment to quality dentistry. We'll see you next time. In our case of the week, the golden rule is observed, but the rule of 27 gets worked over like a rental car on an unpaved road. You got a hair on your eyelash on the other one. Oh wow, very dramatic. No, it's gone. Okay. In our case of the week, the golden rule is observed, but the rule of 27 gets worked over like a Grand Canyon mule. Apparently, the calls were part of a scam. The callers were processing people to go back up to the top of the story. But the rule of 27 gets worked over like a well, you fill in the blank. <laughs> <laughs> I, you don't need a toe. I'm just saying if you do need a toe, I'm there. I'm your guy.